Good evening. There are times when words seem almost inadequate to describe events. And this has been one of those weeks. The installation of a new leader at home and the freeing of 52 Americans abroad. The drama, the trauma, the emotion of it all, it seems unreal, but it all did happen. I'm tempted to say all's well that ends well, Haynes, despite the long nightmare for the hostages. But they are coming home, and the new president is now in his new home. You're talking about words being inadequate. Uh, I think all of us in this business, we go through a period, we think that we deal in superlatives, and there's always, each story is the greatest story. But this one for me, and I think for all of us, and for the country, there had never been a time when so many things came together so swiftly that bound the country together. I mean, for myself, just to be very personal about it, I was sitting up there in front, right directly, front row center in the first seat, looking up at where the new president and the old president were standing, just gathering, and then turning at the, the Capitol. At the Capitol, and turning around this west front, the first time ever in 200 years it's been held there, and looking down, you could see Pennsylvania Avenue, the procession moving at you with both of these new, the, the old and the new coming at you with the lights of the procession. And I had a television uh, plug, uh, plugged into my, and listening to events 8,000 miles away. Literally, the planes are on the runway, the engines are running, they're about to be airborne, getting the bulletin and having it swept through the crowds, and the recognition that all these things that the country had been, and the world, in fact, had been bound up so much in the, in the last 15 months had just evaporated, and there we were the old and the new, and I also watching Jimmy Carter on that inaugural platform. I mean, the sights were so memorable. This ravaged look, someone born through that final moment of frustration. It, uh, it, there has not been an inauguration like it in, for many, many reasons, and the country still hasn't recovered. Well, speaking of the inauguration itself and Mr. Reagan's speech, Haynes, um, a lot of people thought that the new president was brimming with confidence, and perhaps that was a good thing, coming as it did at the time of the hostages being released, almost as if he were seeking a revival of, of, of old-fashioned American optimism. You know, uh, the speech itself uh, was about 20 minutes long, I believe, something like that. Reagan, of course, is a marvelous television performer. His voice is right. Uh, he doesn't shout. Uh, he comes over very well. I don't think this speech would have been a memorable one, however, saying all that, had it not been for the circumstances. For instance, what he said was essentially what he's been saying for many, many years. The government is too large. He restated his positions that we're going to cut back. Uh, we're going to turn back power to the states. Uh, he meant it. He said those things before. And he talked about heroes. Uh, America has not ended its day of heroes and Churchill and so forth. But, you know, really, uh, again, extraordinarily so, uh, the, the timing was just right. Because even as he was saying that, literally, the plane was just about within two minutes to take off from that, uh, from 8,000 miles away in Iran. So I, I think it'll be remembered for these kinds of circumstances. But Haynes, he never once mentioned the hostages, did he? No, Jack, he didn't know. Uh, the President Carter told him. Uh, as much as he knew also. So on that inaugural platform, that is that the plane was on the landing strips, the two planes rather, mm -hmm. the hostages were aboard, they were about to take off, but they hadn't taken off. So you had this peculiar sense that even though there was a false bulletin by a few mm -hmm. minutes, you remember hostages yeah. freed and, and that swept, there was a murmur yeah. through the crowd. Oh, you were, we, we were, and you just feel this sense of, of going on. But he did mention uh, terrorism. That's right. Which was sort of an indirect As reference to a, the... A, a reference to a kind of world in which we live. But there were no martial ringing phrases out of this speech. The idea of a national renewal so many of us picked up in our uh, of necessity, looking for leads as we talk about it in the news business. But every president talks about really an era of national renewal and, and touching. This one, though, did have something more than that. I'll just say personally, uh, last week on this program before the inauguration, I drove by the White House and watched the stands there, the lights. Tonight, the stands are still there. And I was very struck, the Christmas tree is now aglow. It's, it, 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 really, it really hit me. I mean, I'm just, you know, bang, after 15 months it's been lighted. You know, Haynes, it's a rather incredible thing when you, you think here is a, a leader taking power and promising an era of national renewal, talking about growth economically at home and restoring stature abroad. And he has this, in effect, this gift from the previous president yeah. and the circumstances of being given a kind of a, a push, a thrust forward, a new beginning. Uh, internationally, isn't it? It's going to make a tremendous I, difference. I think that, think. I really think, historically, and I, I don't want to, again, deal in superlatives, but I do think that this president has been given, and it has been a gift, as you say, 
and a, a remarkable opportunity because, first of all, he is going to have the attention of the country to an almost unprecedented degree. The hostages are coming home this Sunday. There's going to be a national celebration and joy and bells will ring again. In effect, we'll have a second inaugural ceremony, but it'll be one of liberation. And what he says and how he deals now in the next few weeks is very critical. He's got a great chance because the country is going to listen to him. Haynes, uh, the story that you heard on that thing you had stuck yes. in your ear, this was orchestrated by Iranians right. to make sure that it wouldn't happen on Carter's watch. Does this in any way really detract from Carter as the Iranians obviously intended it to do? It does not seem to me that it Charlie, does. Charlie, I think the, the history of this tragic episode has been one of Iran miscalculating and misunderstanding what we're about. If anything, it made Carter look good and sympathy for a president who, after all, is our president mm -hmm. being dragged. And when you drag the president through it, you drag the country through yeah. it. That's what I think. Mm -hmm. But the real ordeal, of course, was the ordeal that was endured by the hostages and the stories that are now coming out of West Germany where the hostages are. As we learn more, Charlie, it seems clear that they were not treated nearly so well as, as we had been led to believe perhaps they had been. Not at least as far as the public knew. The captivity, Paul, is over. The uh, agony is not for the hostages or for their families or for this nation. We're mixing elation at their release with revulsion at the stories we're hearing, the revelations of brutal treatment. Uh, one of the sergeants looked into the television camera and mulled things over and said, Khomeini is a pig. Uh, one of our diplomats, Richard Queen, referred to the mullahs as slimy bastards. Two of our presidents agree, Carter and Reagan, that barbarians had our people and they're outraged. So who, I think I would like to ask and answer, who are these people, these 52 people? And do they deserve the adulation? Uh, do they deserve an orgy of celebration? They're a cross-section of this country. They range in age from 21, I think, to 65. They're military, they're diplomats, they're clerks, they're a businessman who made a mistake and was in the embassy at the time. They endured the treatment under physical and psychological pressure. They did not embarrass their country. Uh, they weren't sure that the country had not deserted them. They weren't in that much communication, but they did not give up. I think they deserve the welcome they're going to get. But on the other thing, I, on the other hand, I wonder if we have things skewed a bit. I wonder if we remember that they did not endure tortures as our men from the Pueblo did in North Korea, uh, that there were eight heroes who died trying to rescue them, that there were many who also tried to rescue them and survived but are unknown to this nation. There are Vietnam veterans who did not get the treatment these people are going to get. However, all these people demonstrate, at least to my satisfaction, that this is not a soft country. And if there are hostages now, I'd like to in, in, say on a final note, they are the families of these people, and I do hope we'll let them rest.